Death at Gallows Green, Chapter 15 Ha! I have a theory. These flashes come upon me at times. Sherlock Holmes, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, The Sign of Four Charles Sheridan, his hat pulled down over his ears, rapidly took the stairs to the basement of Town Hall, where he pushed his way through the door of the Colchester Department of Police. A stout sergeant, wearing a too tight uniform jacket, looked up from a stack of papers on his desk and gave him a weary nod of recognition. Morning, Sir Charles, he said, moving his elbows. As he did so, several sheets cascaded to the floor and he bent to pick them up. In the process, his pen flipped out of the inkwell, raining droplets of ink on the desk. With an even wearier look, the sergeant resumed his seat. How can I be your service, sir? He picked up the pen wrong end first and looked dismally at the ink on his fat fingers. Why don't they buy your fountain pen battle? Charles asked. He took out a handkerchief and offered it. Is Inspector Wayne right in? With respect, sir, Battle said, the budget's a bit tight with regard to fountain pens. He wiped off his fingers and made as if to return it. Then, noticing with some confusion the inky stains of the snowy cotton, he pulled it back and stuffed it in his pocket. I'll see if the inspector's available, he said, red-faced. As he stood, he dislodged the ledger that fell from the corner of the desk, knocking over a can and spilling dirty sand and chewed stubs of cigars onto the floor. A moment later, when he returned with the news that the inspector was in, he had a broom in his hand and a resigned look on his round face. The inspector's basement office was a square, dingy room with one window let into the wall near the ceiling and gridded over to hinder access from the street. His desk was a table piled with papers, boxes of evidence, and a crumpled paper parcel that from the look of it had recently contained eel pie and baked potato. Inspector Wainwright stood in the corner, taking down two crockery cups from a shelf over a gas burner on which a chipped enamel kettle was beginning to steam. Tea, he asked morosely. Yes, thank you. Charles sat down on one of the two chairs. It is good to see you in such high spirits. Wainwright gave his caller a sideways glance as if to determine if he was joking or not, but he apparently found nothing to smile at for his long grey face remained gloomy. No biscuit, he remarked, and poured the boiling hot water onto a spoonful of tea leaves in the cracked pot. I can do without the biscuits, Charles said. Tell me about Pell. Inspector Wainwright's face, if possible, grew even more gloomy. He put the lid on the pot. Well then, Charles asked, what about hacking? Wainwright's thin moustache drooped. He put his hands in his pocket and stood stoop-shouldered, pondering over the teapot. After several moments, he took his hands out of his pockets and poured the tea, then carried the cups to the table where he pushed the papers, some papers aside to clear a space. He still had said nothing other than tea and no biscuits. Charles sat back in his chair and regarded the inspector. They shared a fairly recent acquaintance, having jointly apprehended the killer of an unfortunate foreign gentleman whose remains had been discovered in an archaeological dig. During the investigation, their relationship had grown from mutual suspicion to grudging respect. But even on the crimes of solution, Wainwright had not seemed cheered by their success. In the several months Charles had known the inspector, he had yet to see the man smile. Charles accepted his cup and looked around for the sugar. I take it, he said mildly, that you do not have a high opinion of either of your superiors. With a long sigh, the inspector finally broke his silence. The Colchester Telephone Exchange has signed on 27 subscribers. He took a packet from his pocket, mournfully counted out four cubes of brown sugar into his tea and handed the packet to Charles. The Colchester police haven't yet subscribed. It will be next month, the superintendent tells me. But he's very mean uh, as to happens. And that's what he's been telling me for the past year. Next month, he stirred his tea with a bent spoon. I see, Charles said. When he had first met Inspector Wainwright, the man was hoping for a typewriter to assist with the mountainous paperwork. But judging from the stacks on both his and Sergeant Battler's desks, he'd hopes had been disappointed. It appears that neither Hacking nor Pell has a great interest in making the force more efficient. The inspector gave his bleak assent. 
Charles shook his head. Well, I suppose I can understand. Little money, less imagination. But why in God's name did Hacking put Pell in charge of the Oliver murder? And why did Pell take Lakin off the case and replace him with a green recruit? Sheer baboonery, Wainwright said with an infinite sadness. Pell's too wrapped up in his ship and business to take any notice of what's afoot, and Hacking's too bone-lazy to care. Doubt we'll see any improvement in the force until they're gone, which won't be in my lifetime, he sighed heavily. But at least they don't have as sticky fingers as they do at the yard. Wainwright never failed to bring up the moral corruption of the Metropolitan Police Force, whose scandals were regularly exposed in the newspapers. It was in his nature to be heavily burdened with the melancholy knowledge that all men, even on occasion the police, had their dark side. Charles leaned forward. What have you heard about the Oliver case? Wainwright sipped his tea. Sheep stealers, he said. Charles frowned. But if there were sheep stealers about, I don't understand why Constable Lakin wouldn't have known. The two districts are contiguous, and Lakin is a careful policeman. Careful as may be, Wainwright replied, but there are gypsies abroad, and where there are gypsies, there are sheep stealers. At least that's the theory. Whose theory? Aggings and Pell's. But I don't see the evidence for it, Charles persisted. Lakin tells me that no one has reported the theft of an animal, and if Oliver had received such reports, he would have informed Lakin. Wainwright shrugged. Well, it's Hacking's theory, and he's not the sort to require a lot of evidence. Pell told him, I guess. Pell's the one who said, uh, said Oliver to work on it anyway. So it's Pell's theory. Pell or Hacking, what does it matter? Wainwright was philosophical. Theories are easy. They come like flashes. It's the evidence that is harder. Is something being done to discover evidence? You'll have to ask P.C. Bradley. That's his business now. I will. Charles finished this tea and stood. You'll send word if you hear anything. The inspector nodded. His eyes were large and sad like those of a bloodhound. I could send it faster with a telephone. No, you couldn't, Charles said. There is no telephone yet at Marston Manor, and not likely to be for quite a while, either. Wainwright looked into his cup and found it empty and pushed it away with a sigh. By the by, what do you hear of Miss Ardley? I have a note from her, Charles said, asking me to call this afternoon. She seems to be adapting admirably to her responsibilities at Bishop's Keep. Is that right? Wainwright replied doubtfully. Sergeant Battle rather wondered when you heard. Heard what? Wainwright's shrug was eloquent. As she was seen in the lake, just a dog riding a bicycle. He paused and raised his glance. In the company of Constable Lakin. Battle thought there might be something between them. Ah, was all Charles could say, and his face went blank with the word. But within himself he felt the stirrings of something that could only be envy. Ned Lakin was a very lucky man.